You know, I, it was interesting. I was, I was here last night early, and we were sitting around the dinner table and just asking, what's going on here in this city? And uh, that's, that's interesting just to hear. There's stuff going on in every city. There's movement in neighborhoods. There's things going on, but we've not quite connected it all. There's not a lot of synergy in most cities that I go into. There's pockets of movement. Your church that you attend is probably doing something locally, but there's not a lot of connection through the city, through the state, and through the country in the U.S. And in fact, we're seeing in the U.S. such a di divisive that Bill mentioned earlier in the video, we're, we have sort of a divisive thing going on nationally, but I'm seeing at the local level opportunity to rise up in connectivity. So our group that actually uh, um, made a video, our group of church leaders, they actually wanted to do something that just kind of pushed the ball down the field. And so Brian Stevenson spoke in the GLS and we ran this video right after Brian Stevenson and it was produced by some millennial young guys in, in our city. And uh, it just started that movement towards what can we do to make a difference in our city? Can we watch that? Have you ever been faced with the daunting realization that you were wrong about the world? Wrong about the way things are. Wrong about why they're that way. A few blocks from my house, I came to an intersection where I always turn right, but decided to take a left. I was surprised at how different this neighborhood looked, and it was less than a mile from my house. I noticed little details that raised questions in my mind, like, why is this man just sitting there at 7.30 in the morning drinking? Is he one of those people you hear about who'd rather live off of food stamps than work at a job? And what about these kids? Shouldn't they be getting ready for school? Don't their parents care enough to tell them not to play in the street? How do these people live like this? Where's their self-respect? And what about this kid? Where are his parents? What chance does he have growing up in a place like this? Most of the people I'd seen in this neighborhood started out just like him, and this thought began to chip away at my assumptions. Maybe I was wrong. Something about that experience clung to me and I began to run through that neighborhood almost every day. I found out that the man I had seen works third shift every night, but he still can't afford to cool his old drafty house. So he sits outside on his front steps and tries to cool down with a cold beer. He hasn't seen his daughter in two weeks. She's supposed to stay with him on weekends, but she keeps canceling. And as for the kids playing in the street, their mom has to take three different buses to get to her first job. And by the time she gets home from her second job, it's already dark outside. Before I knew it, the curiosity that kept bringing me back to this neighborhood had turned to anger. I was angry at the dad who wasn't there for those kids. I was angry at the crummy little convenience store on the corner that charged twice as much for groceries as the store that I drove to. I was angry at all the systems that were supposed to help these people, but were only driving them deeper into dependence. But most of all, I was angry at myself. These were my neighbors.
stopping to talk with people, I've learned a lot. I found there were people moving into these neighborhoods to simply be good neighbors. Many are developing innovative solutions empowering people to better their own circumstances. Businesses, nonprofits, and churches are beginning to partner with neighborhoods to develop whole communities. They say isolation is what allows poverty to sustain its forceful grip in neighborhoods like this. The more I look around, the more hope I found in others trying to break through the isolation. It's not something that happens overnight, but it is happening. And so my young millennial friends that made that movie had a booth in the back of the room. And so here's the sequence. Brian Stevenson did his whole thing, which was an amazing speech, and talked about understanding the narrative. Understanding the narrative in our communities and people's lives and all that. We ran that, and it's kind of like, what, am I, what do I know about my city? And, and honestly, most of us don't live there. I don't live there. And, and a lot of people in the room don't live there. We don't live in those neighborhoods and, and see those people like we should. And then I challenged everybody that was interested to stop by these guys' table that they had put up in the back of the room. And uh, the bottom line is they were bombarded by people wanting to know, how can I engage? What can I do? How can I help make a difference? I say all that to say, that's how you fuel city movements. You take resources of GLS, you take things that are happening and going, you take millennial guys, and it's funny because uh, in millennial guys and 60-year-olds don't always talk well. I, I've learned that. Uh, sometimes I can't quite get through, and yet I'm, I'm their, I try to be their number one fan, and, and we made a hero out of what they produced. And they're working on the sequel for next year. Uh, I think we're probably going to have a series every year at the GLS because they're excited about what God did and the work that's happening. We had 170 organizations in the room, 50% are businesses, and they're asking, okay, as a business, I learned some things, but what am I doing to improve my city? We created a lot of questions in everybody's mind with a five-minute video. So I say all that to say we're leveraging the summit as a resource and we're figuring out how to create community among everybody in the room.